A Midwinter's Tale Maybe I shouldn't tell you about that childhood Christmas Eve in the stone house so long ago. My memory is no longer reliable, not since I contracted the brain fever. Soon I'll be strong enough to be reposted off-planet to some obscure star light years beyond that plangent moon rising over your father's barn. But how much has been burned from my mind? Perhaps none of this actually happened. Sit on my lap and I'll tell you all. Well, then, my knee. No woman was ever ruined by a knee. You laugh, but it's true. Would that it were so easy. The hell of war, as it's now practiced, is that its purpose is not so much to gain territory as to deplete the enemy, and thus it's always better to maim than to kill. A corpse can be bagged, burned, and forgotten, but the wounded need special care. Regrowth tanks, full skin, medical personnel, a long convalescent stay on your parents' farm. That's why they will vary their weapons, hit you with obsolete stone axes or toxins or radiation to force your command to stock the proper prophylaxes, specialized medicines, obscure skills. Mustard gas is excellent for that purpose, and so was the brain fever. All those months I lay in the hospital awash in pain, sometimes hallucinating, dreaming of ice. When I awoke, weak and not really believing I was alive, parts of my life were gone, randomly burned from my memory. I recall standing at the very top of the iron bridge over the Isveltire, laughing and throwing my books one by one into the river, while my best friend, Fenwolf, tried to coax me down. I'll join the militia. I'll be a soldier, I shouted hysterically. And so I did. I remember that clearly, but just what led up to that preposterous instant is utterly beyond me. Nor can I remember the name of my second eldest sister, though her face is as plain to me as yours is now. There are odd holes in my memory. That Christmas Eve is an island of stability in my sea-changing memories, as solid in my mind as the stone house itself— that Neolithic cavern in which we led such basic lives that I was never quite sure in which era of history we dwelt. Sometimes the men came in from the hunt, a laurel or two pacing ahead content and sleepy-eyed to lean bloody spears against the walls, and it might be that we lived on old earth itself then. Other times, as when they brought in projectors to fill the common room with colored lights— Sintily nesting in the branches of the season's tree, and cool, harmless flames dancing atop the presence, we seem to belong to a much later age, in some mythologized province of the future. The house was a bustle, the five families all together for this one time of the year, and outlying kin, and even a few strangers staying over, so that we had to put bedding in places normally kept closed during the winter, moving furniture into attic lumber rooms— and even at that there were cots and thick bolsters set up in the blind ends of hallways. The women scurried through the passages, scattering uncles here and there, now settling one in an armchair and plumping him up like a cushion, now draping one over a table, cocking up a mustachio for effect. A pleasant time. Coming back from a visit to the kitchens where a huge woman I did not know, with flour powdering her big freckled arms up to the elbows, had shooed me away— I surprised Suki and Georg kissing in the nook behind the great hearth. They had their arms about each other, and I stood watching them. Suki was smiling, cheeks red and round. She brushed her hair back with one hand so Georg could nuzzle her ear, turning slightly as she did so, and saw me. She gasped, and they broke apart, flushed and startled. Suki gave me a cookie, dark with molasses, and a single stingy crystallized raisin on top, while Georg sulked. Then she pushed me away, and I heard her laugh as she took Georg's hand to lead him away to some darker forest recess of the house. Father came in, boots all muddy to sling a brace of game birds down on the hunt cabinet. He set his unstrung bow and quiver of arrows on their pegs, then hooked an elbow atop the cabinet to accept admiration and a hot drink from mother. The laurel padded by, quiet and heavy and content. I followed it around a corner, ancient ambitions of riding the beast rising up within. I could see myself, triumphant before my cousins, high atop the black carnivore. Flip, my father called sternly. Leave Samson alone. He is a bold and noble creature, and I will not have you pestering him. He had eyes in the back of his head, had my father.
Before I could grow angry, my cousins hurried by on their way to hoist the straw men into the trees out front and swept me up along with them. Uncle Chittagong, who looked like a lizard and had to stay in a glass tank for reasons of health, winked at me as I scurled past. From the corner of my eye, I saw my second eldest sister beside him, limbed in blue fire. Forgive me. So little of my childhood remains. Vast stretches were lost in the blue ice fields I wandered in my illness. My past is like a sunken continent with only mountain tops remaining unsubmerged, a scattered archipelago of events from which to guess the shape of what was lost. Those remaining fragments I treasure all the more and must pass my hands over them periodically to reassure myself that something remains. So where was I? Ah, yes, I was in the North Bell Tower, my hidey place in those days, huddled behind Old Blind Pew, the base of our triad of bells, crying because I had been deemed too young to light one of the Yule torches. Hello, cried a voice. And then, out here, stupid! I ran to the window, tears forgotten in my astonishment at the sight of my brother Carl silhouetted against the yellowing sky, arms out, treading the roof gables like a tightrope walker. You're going to get in trouble for that, I cried. Not if you don't tell, knowing full well how I worshipped him. Come on down, I've emptied out one of the upper kitchen cupboards. We can crawl in from the pantry. There's a space under the door. We'll see everything. Carl turned, and his legs tangled under him. He fell. Feet first, he slid down the roof. I screamed. Carl caught the guttering and swung himself into an open window underneath. His sharp face rematerialized in the gloom, grinning. Race you to the Jade Ibis! He disappeared. And then I was spinning wildly down the spiral stairs, mad to reach the goal first. It was not my fault we were caught, for I would never have giggled if Carl hadn't been tickling me to see just how long I could keep silent. I was frightened, but not Carl. He threw his head back and laughed until he cried, even as he was being hauled off by three very angry grandmothers, pleased more by his own roguery than by anything he might have seen. I myself was led away by an indulgent Katrina, who graphically described the caning I was to receive and then contrived to lose me in the crush of bodies in the common room. I hid behind the goat tapestry until I got bored, not long, and then Chubkin, Cosmonaut, and Pew rang, and the room emptied. I tagged along, ignored among the moving legs like a marsh bird scuttling through waving grasses. Voices clangoring in the east stairway, we climbed to the highest balcony to watch the solstice dance. I hooked hands over the crumbling balustrade and pulled myself up on tiptoe so I could look down on the procession as it left the house. For a long time, nothing happened, and I remembered being annoyed at how casually the adults were taking all this, standing about with drinks, not one in ten glancing away from themselves. Phaedra and Valerian, the younger children had been put to bed, complaining an hour ago, began a game of tag, running through the adults until they were chastened and ordered with angry shakes of their arms to be still. Then the door below opened. The women who were witches walked solemnly out, clad in hooded terrycloth robes as if they'd just stepped from the bath. But they were so silent I was struck with fear. It seemed as if something cold had reached into the pink, giggling women I had seen preparing themselves in the kitchen and taken away some warmth or laughter from them. Katrina, I cried in panic, and she lifted a moon-cold face toward me. Several of the men exploded in laughter, white steam puffing from bearded mouths, and one rubbed his knuckles in my hair. My second eldest sister drew me away from the balustrade and hissed at me that I was not to cry out to the witches, that this was important, that when I was older I would understand, and in the meantime, if I did not behave myself, I would be beaten. To soften her words, she offered me a sugar crystal, but I turned away stern and unappeased. Single file, the women walked out on the rocks to the east of the house, where all was barren slate swept free of snow by the wind from the sea, and at a great distance— you could not make out their faces, doffed their robes. For a moment they stood motionless in a circle, looking at one another. Then they began the dance, each wearing nothing but a red ribbon tied about one upper thigh, the long end blowing free in the breeze. As they danced their circular dance, the families watched largely in silence. 
Sometimes there was a muffled burst of laughter as one of the younger men muttered a racy comment, but mostly they watched with great respect, even a kind of fear. The gusty sky was dark and flocked with small clouds like purple-headed rams. It was chilly on the roof, and I could not imagine how the women withstood it. They danced faster and faster, and the families grew quieter, packing the edges more tightly until I was forced away from the railing. Cold and bored, I went downstairs, nobody turning to watch me leave, back to the main room, where a fire still smoldered in the hearth. The room was stuffy when I'd left, and cooler now. I lay down on my stomach before the fireplace. The flagstones smelled of ashes and were gritty to the touch, staining my fingertips as I trailed them in idle little circles. The stones were cold at the edges, slowly growing warmer and then suddenly too hot, and I had to snatch my hand away. The back of the fireplace was black with soot, and I watched the fireworms crawl over the stone heart and hands carved there as the carbon caught fire and burned out. The log was all embers and would burn for hours. Something coughed. I turned and saw something moving in the shadows, an animal. The laurel was blacker than black, a hole in the darkness, and my eyes swam to look at him. Slowly, lazily, he strode out onto the stones, stretched his back, yawned a tongue-curling yawn, and then stared at me with those great green eyes. He spoke. I was astonished, of course, but not in the way my father would have been. So much is inexplicable to a child. Merry Christmas, Flip, the creature said in a quiet, breathy voice. I could not describe its accent. I have heard nothing quite like it before or since. There was a vast alien amusement in his glance. And to you, I said politely. The laurel sat down, curling his body heavily about me. If I had wanted to run, I could not have gotten past him, though that thought did not occur to me then. There is an ancient legend, Flip. I wonder if you have heard of it, that on Christmas Eve, the beasts can speak in human tongue. Have your elders told you that? I shook my head. They are neglecting you. Such strange humor dwelt in that voice. There is truth to some of those old legends, if only you knew how to get at it. Though perhaps not all. Some are just stories. Perhaps this is not happening now. Perhaps I am not speaking to you at all. I shook my head. I did not understand. I said so. That is the difference between your kind and mine. My kind understands everything about yours, and yours knows next to nothing about mine. I would like to tell you a story, little one. Would you like that? Yes, I said, for I was young and I liked stories very much. He began. When the great ships landed, oh God, when, no, 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 wait, excuse me, I'm shaken. I just this instant had a vision. It seemed to me that it was night and I was standing at the gates of a cemetery, and suddenly the air was full of light, planes and cones of light that burst from the ground and nested twittering in the trees, fracturing the sky. I wanted to dance for joy but the ground crumbled underfoot, and when I looked down, the shadow of the gates touched my toes, a cold rectangle of profoundest black, deep as all eternity, and I was dizzy and about to fall, and I, and I... Enough! I have had this vision before, many times. It must have been something that impressed me strongly in my youth, the moist smell of newly opened earth, the chalky whitewash on the picket fence. It must be. I do not believe in hobgoblins, ghosts, or premonitions. No, it does not bear thinking about. Foolishness! Let me get on with my story. When the great ships landed, I was feasting on my grandfather's brains. All his descendants gathered respectfully about him, and I, as youngest, had first bite. His wisdom flowed through me, and the wisdom of his ancestors, and the intimate knowledge of those animals he had eaten for food, and the spirit of valiant enemies who had been killed and then honored by being eaten, even as if they were family. I don't suppose you understand this, little one. I shook my head. People never die, you see. Only humans die. Sometimes a minor part of a person is lost, the doings of a few decades, but the bulk of his life is preserved, if not in this body, then in another. Or sometimes a person will dishonor himself, and his descendants will refuse to eat him. This is a great shame, and the person will go off to die somewhere alone. 
The ships descended bright as newborn suns. The people had never seen such a thing. We watched in inarticulate wonder, for we had no language then. You have seen the pictures, the baroque swirls of colored metal, the proud humans stepping down onto the land. But I was there, and I can tell you your people were ill. They stumbled down the gang planks with the stench of radiation sickness about them. We could have destroyed them all then and there. Your people built a village at landfall and planted crops over the bodies of their dead. We left them alone. They did not look like good game. They were too strange and too slow, and we had not yet come to savor your smell, so we went away in baffled ignorance. That was in early spring. Half the survivors were dead by midwinter, some of disease, but most because they did not have enough food. It was of no concern to us. But then the woman in the wilderness came to change our universe forever. When you're older, you'll be taught the woman's tale and what desperation drove her into the wilderness. It's part of your history. But to myself, out in the mountains and winter lean, the sight of her striding through the snows and her furs was like a vision of winter's queen herself, a gift of meat for the hungering season, life's blood for the solstice. I first saw the woman while I was eating her mate. He had emerged from his cabin that evening as he did every sunset, gun in hand, without looking up. I had observed him over the course of five days, and his behavior never varied. On that sixth nightfall, I was crouched on his roof when he came out. I let him go a few steps from the door, then leapt. I felt his neck break on impact, tore open his throat, to be sure, and ripped through his pocket to taste his innards. There was no sport in it, but in winter we will take game whose brains we would never eat. My mouth was full, and my muzzle pleasantly, warmly moist with blood when the woman appeared. I looked up, and she was topping the rise, riding one of your incomprehensible machines, what I know now to be a snow strider. The setting sun broke through the clouds behind her, and for an instant she was embedded in glory. Her shadow stretched narrow before her and touched me, a bridge of darkness between us. We looked in one another's eyes. Magda topped their eyes with a kind of grim, joyless satisfaction. I am now a hunter's woman, she thought to herself. We will always be welcome at landfall for the meat we bring, but they will never speak civilly to me again. Good. I would choke on their sweet talk anyway. The baby stirred, and without looking down, she stroked him through the furs, murmuring, Just a little longer, my brave little boo, and we'll be at our new home. Will you like that, eh? The sun broke through the clouds to her back, making the snow a red dazzle. Then her eyes adjusted, and she saw the black shape crouched over her lover's body. A very great distance away, her hands throttled down the snow strider and brought it to a halt. The shallow bowl of land before her was barren, the snow about the corpse black with blood. A last curl of smoke lazily separated from the hut's chimney. The brute lifted its bloody muzzle and looked at her. Time froze and knotted in black agony. The laurel screamed. It ran straight at her, faster than thought. Clumsily, hampered by the infant strapped to her stomach, Magda clawed the rifle from its boot behind the saddle. She shucked her mittens, fitted hands to metal that stung like hornets, flicked off the safety and brought the stock to her shoulder. The laurel was halfway to her. She aimed and fired. The laurel went down. One shoulder shattered, slamming it to the side. It tumbled and rolled in the snow. You son of a bitch, Magda cried in triumph but almost immediately the beast struggled to its feet, turned and fled. The baby began to cry, outraged by the rifle's roar. Magda powered up the engine. Hush, small warrior. A kind of madness filled her, a blind, anesthetizing rage. This won't take long. She flung her machine downhill after the laurel. Even wounded, the creature was fast. She could barely keep up. As it entered the spare stand of trees to the far end of the meadow, Magda paused to fire again, burning a bullet by its head. The laurel leaped away. From then on, it varied its flight with sudden changes of direction and unexpected jogs to the side. It was a fast learner, but it could not escape Magda. She had always been a hothead, and now her blood was up. She was not about to return to her lover's gutted body with his killer still alive. The sun set, and in the darkening light she lost sight of the laurel, but she was able to follow its trail by two shadowed moonlight. The deep purple footprints, the darker spatter of blood it left, drop by drop in the snow. It was the solstice, and the moons were full, a holy time. I felt it even as I fled the woman through the wilderness. The moons were bright on the snow. I felt the dread of being hunted descend on me, and in my inarticulate way I felt blessed. 
but I also felt a great fear for my kind. We had dismissed the humans as incomprehensible, not very interesting creatures, slow-moving, bad-smelling, and dull-witted. Now, pursued by this madwoman on her fast machine brandishing a weapon that killed from afar, I felt all natural order betrayed. She was a goddess of the hunt, and I was her prey. The people had to be told. I gained distance from her, but I knew the woman would catch up. She was a hunter, and a hunter never abandons wounded prey. One way or another, she would have me. In the winter, all who are injured or too old must offer themselves to the community. The sacrifice rock was not far, by a hill riddled from time beyond memory with our burrows. My knowledge must be shared. The humans were dangerous. They would make good prey. I reached my goal when the moons were highest. The flat rock was bare of snow when I ran limping in. Awakened by the scent of my blood, several people emerged from their dens. I lay myself down on the sacrifice rock. A grandmother of the people came forward, licked my wound, tasting, considering. Then she nudged me away with her forehead. The wound would heal, she thought, and winter was young. My flesh was not yet needed. But I stayed. Again she nudged me away. I refused to go. She whined in puzzlement. I licked the rock. That was understood. Two of the people came forward and placed their weight on me. A third lifted a paw. He shattered my skull, and they ate. Magda watched through power binoculars from atop a nearby ridge. She saw everything. The rock swarmed with lean black horrors. It would be dangerous to go down among them, so she waited and watched the puzzling tableau below. The laurel had wanted to die, she'd swear it. And now the beasts came forward daintily, almost ritualistically, to taste the young first and then the old. She raised her rifle, thinking to exterminate a few of the brutes from afar. A curious thing happened then. All the laurels that had eaten of her prey's brain leaped away, scattering. Those that had not eaten waited, easy targets, not understanding. Then another dipped to lap up a fragment of brain and looked up with sudden comprehension. Fear touched her. The hunter had spoken often of the laurels, had said that they were so elusive he sometimes thought them intelligent. Come spring, when I can afford to waste ammunition on carnivores, I look forward to harvesting a few of these beauties, he'd said. He was the colony's xenobiologist, and he loved the animals he killed, treasured them even as he smoked their flesh, tanned their hides, and drew detailed pictures of their internal organs. Magda had always scoffed at his theory that laurels gained insight into the habits of their prey by eating their brains— even though he'd spent much time observing the animals minutely from afar, gathering evidence. Now she wondered if he was right. Her baby whimpered, and she slid a hand inside her furs to give him a breast. Suddenly the night seemed cold and dangerous, and she thought, what am I doing here? Sanity returned to her all at once, her anger collapsing to nothing, like an ice tower shattering in the wind. Below, sleek black shapes sped toward her across the snow, they changed direction every few leaps, running evasive patterns to avoid her fire. Hang on, kid, she muttered, and turned her strider around. She opened up the throttle. Magda kept to the open as much as she could, the creatures following her from a distance. Twice she stopped abruptly and turned her rifle on her pursuers. Instantly they disappeared in puffs of snow, crouching belly down but not stopping, burrowing toward her under the surface. In the eerie night silence she could hear the whispering sound of the brutes tunneling. She fled. Some frantic, timeless period later, the sky had still not lightened in the east. Magda was leaping a frozen stream when the strider's left ski struck a rock. The machine was knocked glancingly upward, cybernetic screaming as they fought to regain balance. With a sickening crunch, the strider slammed to earth, one ski twisted and bent. It would take extensive work before the strider could move again. Magda dismounted. She opened her robe and looked down on her child. He smiled up at her and made a gurgling noise. Something went dead in her. A fool. I've been a criminal fool, she thought. Magda was a proud woman who had always refused to regret, even privately, anything she had done. Now she regretted everything, her anger, the hunter, her entire life, all that had brought her to this point, the cumulative madness that threatened to kill her child. A laurel topped the ridge. Magda raised her rifle and it ducked down. She began walking down slope parallel to the stream. The snow was knee-deep, and she had to walk carefully not to slip and fall. Small pellets of snow rolled down ahead of her, were overtaken by other pellets. 
She strode ahead, pushing up a wake. The hunter's cabin was not many miles distant. If she could reach it, they would live. But a mile was a long way in winter. She could hear the laurels calling to each other, soft cough-like noises to either side of the ravine. They were following the sound of her passage through the snow. Well, let them. She still had the rifle. And if it had few bullets left, they didn't know that. They were only animals. This high in the mountains, the trees were sparse. Magda descended a good quarter mile before the ravine choked with scrub and she had to climb up and out or risk being ambushed. Which way, she wondered. She heard three coughs to her right and climbed the left slope, alert and wary. We herded her. Through the long night, we gave her fleeting glimpses of our bodies whenever she started to turn to the side she must not go and let her pass unmolested the other way. We let her see us dig into the distant snow and wait motionless, indetectable. We filled the woods with our shadows. Slowly, slowly, we turned her around. She struggled to return to the cabin, but she could not. In what haze of fear and despair she walked. We could smell it. Sometimes her baby cried and she hushed the milky-scented creature in a voice gone flat with futility. The night deepened as the moons sank in the sky. We forced the woman back up into the mountains. Toward the end, her legs failed her several times. She lacked our strength and stamina, but her patience and guile were every bit our match. Once we approached her still form and she killed two of us before the rest could retreat. How we loved her. We paced her, confident that sooner or later she'd drop. It was at night's darkest hour that the woman was forced back to the burrowed hillside, the sacred place of the people where stood the sacrifice rock. She topped the same rise for the second time that night and saw it. For a moment she stood helpless, and then she burst into tears. We waited, for this was the holiest moment of the hunt, the point when the prey recognizes and accepts her destiny. After a time, the woman's sobs ceased. She raised her head and straightened her back. Slowly, steadily, she walked downhill. She knew what to do. Laurels retreated into their burrows at the sight of her, gleaming eyes dissolving into darkness. Magna ignored them. Numb and aching, weary to death, she walked to the sacrifice rock. It had to be this way. Magda opened her coat, unstrapped her baby. She wrapped him deep in the furs and laid the bundle down to one side of the rock. Dizzily, she opened the bundle to kiss the top of his sweet head, and he made an angry sound. Good for you, kid, she said hoarsely. Keep that attitude. She was so tired. She took off her sweaters, her vest, her blouse, the raw cold nipped at her flesh with teeth of ice. She stretched slightly, body aching with motion. God, it felt good. She laid down the rifle. She knelt. The rock was black with dried blood. She lay down flat, as she had earlier seen her laurel do. The stone was cold, so cold it almost blanked out the pain. Her pursuers waited nearby, curious to see what she was doing. She could hear the soft panting noise of their breathing. One padded noiselessly to her side. She could smell the brute. It whined questioningly. She licked the rock. Once it was understood what the woman wanted, her sacrifice went quickly. I raised a paw, smashed her skull. Again, I was youngest, innocent. I bent to taste. The neighbors were gathering, hammering at the door, climbing over one another to peer through the windows, making the walls bulge and breathe with their eagerness. I grunted and bellowed, and the clash of silver and clink of plates next door grew louder. Like peasant animals, my husband's people tried to drown out the sound of my pain with toasts and drunken jokes. Through the window I saw Tevin the Fool's bone-white skin gaunt on his skull, and behind him a slice of face, sharp nose, white cheeks, like a mask. The doors and walls pulsed with the weight of those outside— in the next room, children fought and wrestled, and elders pulled at their long white beards, staring anxiously at the closed door. The midwife shook her head, red lines running from the corners of her mouth down either side of her stern chin. Her eye sockets were shadowy pools of dust. Now push, she cried. Don't be a lazy sow. I groaned and arched my back. I shoved my head back, and it grew smaller, eaten up by the pillows. The bed frame skewed as one leg slowly buckled under it. My husband glanced over his shoulder at me, an angry look, his fingers knotted behind his back. All of landfall shouted and hovered on the walls. Here it comes, shrieked the midwife. She reached down to my bloody crotch and eased out a tiny head, purple and angry like a goblin. 
and then all the walls glowed red and green and sprouted large flowers. The door turned orange and burst open, and the neighbors and crew flooded in. The ceiling billowed up, and aerialists tumbled through the rafters. A boy who had been hiding beneath the bed flew up laughing to where the ancient sky and stars shone through the roof. They held up the child, bloody on a platter. Here the laurel touched me for the first time, that heavy black paw, like velvet on my knee, talons sheathed. Can you understand, he asked, what it meant to me, all that, the first birth of human young on this planet, I experienced in an instant. I felt it with full human comprehension. I understood the personal tragedy and the community triumph and the meaning of the lives and culture behind it. A second before, I lived as an animal, with an animal's simple thoughts and hopes. Then I ate of your ancestor. I was lifted all in an instant halfway to godhood, as the woman had intended. She had died with her child's birth foremost in her mind in order that we might share in it. She gave us that. She gave us more. She gave us language. We were wise animals before we ate her brain, and we were people afterward. We owed her so much, and we knew what she wanted from us. The laurel stroked my cheek with his great velvety paw, the ivory claws sheathed but quivering slightly as if about to awake. I hardly dared breathe. That morning I entered landfall carrying the baby's sling in my mouth. It slept through most of the journey. At dawn I passed through the empty street as silently as I knew how. I came to the first captain's house. I heard the murmur of voices within. The entire village assembled for worship. I tapped the door with one paw. There was sudden astonished silence. Then slowly, fearfully, the door opened. The laurel was silent for a moment. That was the beginning of the association of people with humans. We were welcomed into your homes, and we helped with the hunting. It was a fair trade. Our food saved many lives that first winter. No one needed know how the woman had perished or how well we understood your kind. That child flip was your ancestor. Every few generations we take one of your family out hunting and taste his brains to maintain our closeness with your line. If you are a good boy and grow up to be as bold and honest, as intelligent and noble a man as your father, then perhaps it will be you we eat. The laurel presented his blunt muzzle to me in what might have been meant as a friendly smile. Perhaps not. The expression hangs unreadable, ambiguous in my mind even now. Then he stood and padded away into the friendly dark shadows of the stone house. I was sitting staring into the coals a few minutes later when my second eldest sister, her face a featureless blaze of light like an angel's, came into the room and saw me. She held out a hand, saying, Come on, Flip, you're missing everything. And I went with her. Did any of this actually happen? Sometimes I wonder. But it's growing late, and your parents are away. My room is small but snug, my bed warm but empty. We can burrow deep in the blankets and scare away the cave bears by playing the oldest winter games there are. You're blushing. Don't tug away your hand. I'll be gone soon to some distant world to fight in a war for people who are as unknown to you as they are to me. Soldiers grow old slowly, you know. We're shipped frozen between the stars. When you are old and plump and happily surrounded by grandchildren, I'll still be young and thinking of you. You'll remember me then, and our thoughts will touch in the void. Will you have nothing to regret? Is that really what you want? Come, don't be shy. Let's put the past aside and get on with our lives. That's better. Blow the candle out, love, and there's an end to my tale. All this happened long ago, on a planet whose name has been burned from my memory.